So I've gotten the question a few times on my channel now as to why I chose a 11.5 foot canoe rather than the typical 14, 15 or even 16 foot canoes. And I suppose that comes down to three key reasons. One, I wanted portability and easy of, of maneuverability. Um, so that was really about putting it on a car, carrying it, that type of thing. Um, Maneuverability in, in a small river or creek, you would have seen on Tangle River that it was very easy to turn the canoe around in that tight little creek and so forth and with a larger canoe you simply can't do that. The third reason was capacity. Um, I don't actually need a lot of carrying capacity. Uh, I'll show you some footage of all my gear laid down on a blanket but also then all loaded into the canoe and essentially just three bags, paddles and fishing gear. And that's all I need. So I don't need a 14, 15, 16 foot canoe to carry all my equipment in. So with the lightweight Kevlar options, I did a lot of research in that area as well. And there's some superb canoes made in really light, um, light weave Kevlar and so forth that uh, weigh absolutely nothing. Sub 20 kilograms for a 15, 16 foot canoe. Absolutely sensational. But when I then started looking at some of the higher companies that were using them, some of the reviews and blogs and so forth, what I discovered was they're great on lakes, but you can't use them in moving water. There was one particular gentleman who put up a blog about using them and so forth from a hire company, so they actually hired out a whole range of different types of the canoes. And they were saying with the Kevlar one and how to look after that canoe is, if there's rocks on the side of the actual lake or river where you are, you have to get out of the canoe before the canoe even touches those rocks. It cannot touch the rocks whilst you're in the canoe or while there's anything in that canoe. Now I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people say, oh no, they're not that weak, they're not that fragile. But I can tell you, the reviews and, and the information I've seen on the internet tells me the opposite, that they are great and light and fantastic in, in lake systems. But if there's any sort of rocks or snags, and I'll show you the bottom of my canoe, it's now absolutely trashed. You just cannot do that in these lightweight Kevlar's. That's not what they're designed for. And that's okay for some. For me, Mine gets bashed around, it will get used all the time, and I want it to be able to go absolutely anywhere. I do not want to be restricted um, just to have a lighter canoe. Now the great thing about, once again, a little 11 and a half foot, is this thing's around 20 kilograms anyway. So it's fine to carry above my head, I can easily load it onto the car by myself, on and off, no issue at all. Easy to carry around and easy to portage. So that was a really big factor for me that I wanted it lightweight but I also wanted it to be nice and strong and tough and Dan uses a, a new technology what they call bag molding where they actually push a bag on the inside of it and it squeezes out the excess resin so that it takes all the weight out of the fiberglass which is really great technology. No wind. The two other aspects I was interested in is one was on carrying on the roof of the vehicle now I've looked at a lot of, once again, videos and so forth of other YouTubers making fantastic videos in Canada and North America and into Europe and the UK. One thing I noticed was all these 14, 15, 16 footers on each end of the canoe, they had ropes going down to the bumper bar or the underneath of the vehicle. And they needed that simply because the wind will catch that canoe at the front or the back and have too much rocker because of the simple length of that, that actual canoe. Now I've had my canoe on the top of my car at 120 kilometres an hour passing someone on a freeway, no issue at all, it does not move around at all, so there's no reason to tie that down at the front and the back, it simply does not need that. Two straps on standard roll bar, uh, standard carrying bars that come with a normal car, no issue at all. So like all things outdoors related, when it comes to selecting equipment we often go for the bigger option. Um, I had this when I was hiking a lot back in the, uh, the 80s and 90s and obviously the bigger the pack the more gear you can carry which is fantastic but on the second, third and fourth day you really start to notice that. When I looked at the videos on YouTube etc and what people were doing with canoes I noticed a lot of people used the big barrel systems in the actual canoe to carry all their food etc which is fine and I understand why they do that particularly if they're doing you know, multi-night um, canoe trips and so forth and also if they go on the rivers and there's a chance of all of that equipment coming out into the water etc. But when I thought about what I'm going to do here in Australia, I'm not going to be doing those big wild whitewater river, uh, river trips. Yes I'll do river trips but not where there's big major, you know, level one, two, three and four um, rapids etc. where you're going down big chutes and all that sort of stuff and there's a chance of the canoe turning over. So I don't want to or need to carry a great big barrel for food and etc. So for me it's just going to be that long blue bag that I use all the time that you see, the dry bag. 
and the esky for food and that covers 99 percent of what i need the little smaller blue bag you'll notice that's full of technology that has my drone in it my camera's equipment in it has speaker in it uh, lights etc all the technology goes in that blue blue dry bag and that's the three main pieces that go into my canoe so i don't need a long enough canoe to take one two three or four barrels uh, because I'm simply not going to carry that much equipment. The other thing I've noticed though, of course, is often these people will then have airbags at the front and airbags at the back to keep the canoe flotation-wise if it goes underwater. Now that's great, but you've just removed probably about half the carrying capacity or at least a third of the carrying capacity of your canoe just by putting those airbags in. And once again, I don't want airbags. This thing's got built-in flotation front and back, so it's never going to sink. But that's only reduced its capacity by about two or three percent. So I don't want to have the 16 footer and then have all that taken up by airbags to reduce my capacity. I just don't see the point in that. So as a part of the evaluation process, I then hired a canoe from the One Tree Canoe Company, Dan and Sue, and took it out to a, uh, an overnight camp with um, the equipment I had at that point in time, which of course is all the minimalist equipment, somewhat heavier than others. And I discovered even on that one overnight trip that it had more than enough capacity to carry all that equipment. In fact, I could put a whole lot more in if I wanted to, but of course that means it's more to pack and more to carry, etc. So that trip was enough to cement my idea in my head that this was the right size canoe. I've since done uh, two night uh, camps as well. So the only thing that really changed from one night, two night, three night, five nights, of course, is food and how much food you can carry with you. I don't use dehydrated fuse. I always use fresh food. And the esky I've got that goes in the back of my canoe will hold enough for two, three, probably four nights easily. Uh, the only thing that takes out the bulk of the room, in fact, is actually the beer. So uh, the capacity wise, it was fine. The other thing I'm looking for, of course, is a fishing platform. Now, what I haven't done yet is put any rod holders on this boat. Um, I will put some behind me, one on each side. I found a system that will allow me to actually put rod holders on each side and also GoPro mounts, etc. So I'll do that at some point in time. But once again, because of the size of the canoe, easy to maneuver in around trees and snags, that type of stuff. And it also uh, means that everything's within reach. Um, plenty of leg room. I'm six foot four, but I can spread my legs out and uh, easily pull a fish in, put it down between my legs and do what I need to do, etc. And all my tackle simply slides in under the seat underneath me and knives and so forth behind me. So there's plenty of room for fishing, but not to the point where you've got a great big long 15, 16 footer dancing around in the wind in front of you as well. And I think that's probably um, one thing I've discovered even with 11 and a half footer, the wind does pick it up, particularly when it's empty. So I can't imagine how difficult that would be in a longer canoe as well. The other aspect I looked into was the type of materials the canoe was made from. As I said in my original um, canoeing video, the options of plastic canoes, Kevlar canoes and so forth are, are large and huge these days. That's pretty much what 99% of the market is. So when I looked at those options, as I've said previously, I don't like the idea of the plastic canoes, the polyethylenes and so forth. They will break down over time. Yes, they're strong and yes, they're tough. Absolutely, particularly the two or three skin ones are very, very tough canoes. There's no doubt about that. But I have seen them sitting behind sheds and so forth with cracks in them, with holes in them and so forth, and they cannot be repaired and they simply go to landfill. Now with my canoe, the fiberglass one, you can use a fiberglass repair kit. And I can take that with me on a long, longer trip. If it's just overnight, I'm not too stressed about it. But if I'm doing two, three, four, five nights or a week or something, I can take this little fiberglass canoe repair kit with me and I can actually fix any damage to that canoe, structural or just minor holes, etc. cetera, 100% um, with a canoe repair kit because it's fiberglass, very, very quick and easy to repair. So that's my thoughts on how I went about choosing a canoe. I'm very, very happy with this canoe. It's absolutely perfect for me. I do not need a bigger canoe, um, and nor do I need a different style or type of canoe. Very interested though in hearing everyone's thoughts and comments on that. If you're a canoeist, or you've had a canoe, or you want to get a canoe, etc., love to hear your thoughts on this. And people out of the UK and America and Canada and so forth that have canoes and are using them already, 
Love to hear in your comments below what is it the selection process you used, what's the type of water you're using the canoe on, etc., and um, why you ended up with the brand you ended up with. What I'm trying to do here is provide a lot of information back to this canoeing or paddling community so that other people that I've spoken to on Facebook and Instagram and so forth can also then understand why it is that I chose my canoe and why it is people choose other canoes as well. And that way we all learn as a community and uh, hopefully we encourage more and more people to get out paddling. So anyway, I'll wrap it up for this week. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in the fortnight's time and I'm back on the water. Bye for now.